All right, hello everybody. Um, I'm gonna be speaking to you about open source intelligence um, and looking at how cognitive biases um, and critical thinking uh, can impact open source intelligence analysis. So a little bit about myself. My name is Benjamin Brown. I work for Akamai Technologies, a large content delivery network. Um, and I work on their external network, um, the internet essentially, uh, doing system safety, complex systems analysis, um, novel uh, security research for novel attacks, um, and threat intelligence. Yes, it's a buzzword, um, but that's the world we're gonna be swimming in here. The threat intelligence, uh, security intelligence, APT, that sort of stuff. Um, and to give you some uh, idea, some context about what we're talking about here, the world is cognitive biases, open source intelligence, um, metacognition, we'll get into that a little bit later, critical thinking, and then specific frameworks for structured analysis of open source intelligence. All right, so why should we care about this? Well, a lot of our decisions, both on the strategic level and the operational level, um, are born out of uh, this sort of actionable intelligence that we've come up with. And we're assuming that it's accurate conclusions that, we, that have been properly framed for us. Um, but a lot of times what we're not taking into account is that cognitive biases, also called faulty heuristics, are putting pressure on uh, the intelligence analysis process and having us uh, be led to inaccurate conclusions which then have us make poor decisions. So, what can we do about that? Well, one place to look is metacognition and critical thinking. What they allow us to do is recognize and correct for these cognitive biases. And they also allow us to arrive at more accurate solutions more often. So, a higher level view here, I'll give you a picture. You have bad data and biased analysis, and they're feeding into false conclusions. These false conclusions are generating bad intelligence, and we're making poor decisions based on this bad intelligence. What does that lead to? Apocalypse and Armageddon. Yeah, that might seem a little, you know, over the top um, and a, a bit of a hyperbole, but if anybody here is familiar with the Bay of Pigs incident or the Cuban Missile Crisis, that's exactly what happened. We are headed for a very, very bad state of affairs based on bad intelligence and poor analysis that was heavily biased. Now, um, laying some groundwork for what I'm talking about when I say open source intelligence. So the uh, US Army, uh, they say that open source intelligence is intelligence that's produced from publicly available information. What is publicly available information? Well, when we're talking about publicly available information, the typical quality leaves a lot to be desired. It's like the inquire that you see at the uh, grocery checkout store or something like that. A lot of times, it's crap. So, what do we need to do? Well, when it's out there in the public and it's crap, it's usually just data. It's not actually intelligence that can be acted upon. This is where we need to discern for ourselves between information or data and actual intelligence. Intelligence comes out of analysis. And intelligence has three markers. It's timely, it's relevant, and it's actionable. Um, so since this is open source intelligence, where are we getting this information? We're not getting it from confidential informants or anything like that. Um, we're getting it from search engines like Google, or if you hate yourself, Bing. Um, social networks, uh, Reddit, people say way too much on Reddit about themselves. Um, also, communication services like IRC, still alive and well. Um, if you're from the Eastern Bloc, ICQ, still very much alive, which is weird to me. Um, also, e-commerce site profiles. Somebody's Amazon history, especially their uh, commenting history, is very interesting. Uh, also, doing um, business and tax record searches. Especially in the US, these are very easy to find. Lots of information about uh, business owners, uh, people who are co-owners, um, and business entities themselves uh, on the state level, the uh, county level, and um, the federal level, of course. Um, another place to get open source intelligence uh, is the media, but you want to take that with a grain of salt, because this is um, information that is coming out of a very specific viewpoint for a very specific set of purposes. 
So you want to take that whole context into account. So what kind of tools are useful for gathering this sort of information? So Recon NG, sorry, I have a bit of a cold here. Um, Recon NG is a really cool framework. Um, I suggest everybody here, even if um, open source intelligence isn't your thing, go check out Recon NG. It's a lot of fun and really creepy. Um, EXIF tool, you can get lots of cool stuff from EXIF data from uh, photos and other um, pieces of media, uh, things like the GPS coordinates and the device that was used um, to take the photo. Uh, the Harvester, it's really good for um, analyzing uh, companies or entities, uh, finding all the email addresses that are publicly available for them, which is great for social engineering or spear phishing. Um, Multigo, Multigo is great because it allows our brain to sort of shortcut some of the biases by looking at the data in a completely different way. We're not seeing it in a traditional list, we're seeing it as a visualization, as a web of connections which allow us to come up with other ideas or ways of thinking about the data. All right, so let's talk about cognitive bias. And when I tell you what I'm talking about with cognitive bias, first I'm gonna tell you what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about anything to do with uh, faith-based or spiritual or uh, religious, cultural, things like that. Um, those sorts of uh, biases or heuristics aren't what uh, are at issue here. What I am talking about is the way that our brain deals with the massive amounts of information that are just pouring towards us all the time. So we've got information coming from all of our senses just being fed in constantly. And how our brain deals with all of that instead of just having us stuck in analysis paralysis is we have these shortened patterns of subjective judgment, these simplified processing strategies that allow us to take shortcuts with a little bit of information. So I'll give you an example. Um, on how we don't actually see things as they are out in the world. Our brain deduces them based on different snippets of information. So if everybody looks at this uh, photo up here, um, sections A and sections B that are marked, the squares here, A is in the top left, B is in the center. It looks like A is darker than B. Is that pretty much what everybody else sees? Yeah, okay, um, so what's weird about this is that a and B are the exact same color. If I were to take the color picker or take this into Photoshop, A and B would have the exact same color value. But that's not what our brain is, is deducing or telling us that is going on there. It's looking at the different information about the checkerboard pattern, the um, angle of the dimensions. It looks, it's looking at the shadow um, being laid across by this object. Uh, and it's saying, oh, well, because of all this little bits of information, A must be dark and B must be light, when that's not actually the case. If that can happen with our eyes, where else can that happen? All right, so I'll give you, uh, I'll start breaking down cognitive bias into uh, some very specific subsets of biases. This one a lot of people here have probably heard of, confirmation bias. So um, when you're going to do research or going to look for some information, uh, it's very normal for a human being to sort of have in the back of their head uh, an idea about how it's probably going to turn out, what the case probably is. But that's a little insidious in that when that's working in your subconscious, that idea about uh, this is probably what the right answer is, you are either consciously or unconsciously um, denying certain types of information that go against what you think might be true, and you're just specifically looking for information that fits what you think is already true in the world. So you're really missing a lot and not really doing much for yourself in terms of analysis. Um, another one, and this one we see Mario doing with Yoshi all the time, is uh, self-serving bias. Always looking at self-enhancement, self-preservation, self-esteem, and social or career advancement. And I want to be very specific in, in letting you guys know that I'm not saying these biases are inherently bad. They're useful. They serve a purpose. They allow us to conduct ourselves as beings in a social setting. But they also cause us to do, act, and think in ways that can be detrimental to intelligence analysis. 
Another one is the echo effect. This one uh, we see a lot more lately with things like Twitter, Facebook. Um, you get uh, these, like it's a game of media telephone. You get these little snippets of stories where you don't actually know where the source is, but it's repeated over and over and over again, and maybe changes a little bit each time it's repeated. Um, this causes things like the bandwagon effect. It promotes groupthink. And inherently, humans, as we're seeing this piece of data produce over and over and over again, it's starting to gain weight and credibility in our minds, even if it doesn't have uh, anything to do with reality. Um, this bias is a little bit more uh, in-depth or involved. It's the representativeness bias. This one is where we're focusing on similarities and we're neglecting the differences in systems. And I'll give you some examples um, of this specifically later. Um, but one of the classic tales of representativeness bias is the, um, the four blind men and the elephant. Well, one is feeling the trunk and saying, oh, this must be a snake. One is feeling the tail, saying, oh, this must be a rope, and so on and so forth. They're only looking at the very small section of the entire picture and making an assumption about what's going on. Um, one of the subsets of this bias is the base rate neglect bias. This one's very cool. This one you'll see specifically when media tries to throw at you really um, scary looking statistics. What you want to look at is the base rate. What's the actual rate for their base that they're using? Um, and a specific tool that you can use for this is Bayes' theorem. So uh, this is Bayes' theorem here. If anybody's taken, I don't know, house, high school or um, you know, two-year college statistics, you've probably had to do something with this. Um, it actually is useful, especially when somebody tries to throw DDoS statistics at you. So availability bias. This one is one we don't really think about a lot. Um, and this has to do with things like uh, anec data, anecdotal data, um, where the human mind inherently really, really likes uh, first or second-hand accounts that are relayed to them. Even if we read something in a, a well-renowned scholarly journal, we're less likely to give that the same weight that we, that we would give a story from our friend, even if our friend has no way of knowing anything close to you know, what the person who wrote that scholarly article would know. And this is just how we developed as social creatures. And um, topics trend power, again, uh, hearkening back to uh, where we talked about the echo effect. Um, inherently, we're going to start giving something that we see over and over again more weight. Um, censorship, what are we missing that we don't know we're missing because it's being stopped through censorship? Are we actually making notes of the gaps in information? Also. How many languages are you fluent in? And how many of the dialects and subcontext and subcultures within those languages are you able to really pull out all of the meaning? Because this is going to affect the type of data um, and the way you're analyzing your data. If you only speak English and you only live in the Midwest, you're only going to be understanding the context of you know, people that are posting information from the Midwest speaking English you're going to miss out a whole lot of other stuff. Also, um, this uh, Maskirovka, this is something that um, the Russians have as a very specific part of their core uh, military intelligence platform. And um, a subsection of this is disinformation. And um, they employed it uh, better than anybody else, especially during the Cold War. And um, it was uh, ingenious how they did it. Um, one of their main tactics was to flood communication channels with lots and lots of false information. Okay, yeah, that's scary. They're you know, overwhelming you with false information. But what was really clever is they would also put in true information. Why is that clever? Well, if it's just a bunch of false information, you look for the gaps. And that's probably where the truth is. But if it's true information and false information mixed together, it's just noise, which is really hard to analyze. And you see this uh, in, um, when uh, anonymous these days is being used as a false flag operation or another op is spun up underneath another one. Uh, you can start to see this mix of false information with true information, true actors with false actors. All right, so I gave you a bunch of theory. Let's look at these things in the real world now. 
This is the uh, one that I was actually present for. Um, when I was in Boston during the Boston bombings, um, I was, you know, of course, with everybody else looking for more information, trying to find out what's going on. And um, a group on Reddit, a very large group, decided to play Internet Police. Um, they're going to figure out uh, who committed the Boston bombings, and um, you know, they can definitely do a much better job than highly trained professionals. So, some of their methodology. Uh, they would look at publicly posted marathon photos or videos, and they would try and pick out who they felt wasn't paying enough attention to the race at that specific moment in the photo. Um, also, uh, they would take uh, snippets of the police scanner um, data out of context. If anybody here uh, does a lot of uh, emergency service radio work, um, then you probably know that, uh, yes, there are um, open channels, but they change, and there's also encrypted channels which have more data that goes with the open channels. They, of course, didn't have access to that data, so it was very much without context. Um, they started naming multiple suspects based on this very bad open source intelligence they were developing. Now, if it was in a, a bubble or a vacuum by itself, that wouldn't be so bad. But what, where it really got bad was when international media started picking up on the people who they were claiming probably did the bombing and started repeating it and started giving it credibility. So the media outlets started running bad info from Reddit. And I will show you, uh, there's a, a show, Newsroom, that did a very good piece on this specifically that I just recently found. So Neil Trapathy was a student at Brown. He was reported missing about a month ago. His family set up a Facebook page for anyone who might have information about where he is. Now, yesterday at 5 p.m., in response to Thursday's Post front page, misidentifying two innocent people as enemies of the state, the FBI issued these photos of the actual suspects. Now, here's what happened next. Within minutes, users on Reddit... All got together and decided that the best thing to do was to step back and let the professionals do their jobs. They began comparing the FBI photo of one of the suspects to Sunil Tripathi. By 10 p.m., it had become a leading theory on Reddit that Tripathi was suspect number two. At 2.43 this morning, a man named Greg Hughes tweeted that the Boston police scanner had identified the names of the suspects as Mike Mulageta and Sunil Tripathi. Earlier in the night, Greg Hughes had tweeted in 2013, all you need is a connection to the Boston police scanner and a Twitter feed to know what's up. We don't even need TV anymore. No, he tells me. I just bought a new plasma. I big? 28 inches, baby. The whole ride. Seven minutes after the Greg Hughes tweet, Kevin Galliford, a cameraman for Hartford's CBS affiliate, picks up on the Hughes tweet and he relays the same information to his followers. Moments after that, a reporter at BuzzFeed sends a tweet out to his 81,000 followers. A reporter at BuzzFeed has 81,000 followers. How many do you have? One, him. She's funny. I like her jokes. I'll follow you. I'm not on Twitter. Really? Really. I wonder who I've been following. Guys, please. The BuzzFeed tweet says, wow, Reddit was right, suspect identified as Sunil Tripathi. Two questions. Do we know who Greg Hughes is? He's a guy on Reddit. Second question is that by this point at 2.43 this morning, has anyone at our network checked on Sunil Tripathi? Of course we have. And? Five senior officials with the FBI, three with the Justice Department, including one from the Attorney General's office, another five from the Boston PD, all of them willing to be identified on the record, all of them categorically denying that Sunil Tripathi is a suspect. Also the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh -huh. When you put their certainty up against Greg Hughes' certainty, I don't know who the hell to believe. 2.57 a.m., 14 minutes after the first tweet, an NBC News correspondent tweets the Sunil Tripathi theory to his 180,000 followers. 180,000? At least it's been downgraded to a theory. A half hour later, Perez Hilton sends it out. I don't even want to know. Six million. The internet celebrates that Reddit has solved the bombing, John King is a stooge, uh, the Post is irresponsible, and the FBI is inept. So So you can see how quickly that wildfire spread, right? Turns out uh, Sunil Tripathi um, uh, had been missing because he had drowned. So uh, his uh, family is not only having to deal with all of this going on across the media um, and harassment and um, you know, people calling in threats to them, um, but uh, they're also grieving their dead son. Uh, so there's a real world impact to this. All right, so what biases were at effect here? Well, the bandwagon effect, for sure, the echo effect, availability bias, the availability of the information they had and didn't have, 
self-serving bias. There's karma and internet points to be had. Um, also confirmation bias, which here was rather insidious because all of the people that got to the top of their list of people that they were naming as suspects were brown males. Surprise, turns out the guys who actually did it were as white as you can get because they were actually from the Caucasus. They were Caucasian. All right, APT, drink. Um, so in the US, I don't know if it's the same here, but in the US, when somebody says advanced persistent threat, people flip out. And they're like, oh my god, China. Um, so a lot of uh, companies uh, who have put out uh, threat intelligence reports um, calling out China um, have looked at a lot of open source uh, information uh, and connected the dots, like uh, the type of uh, RAT that was used, remote administration tool, which anybody can use freely, the same type. Uh, geolocation of the command and control, they used MaxMind. Really accurate, right guys? Um, also looking at shared similarities with past APTs. What did we say about representativeness? That's just looking at shared similarities. They didn't name a single difference between past APTs. Now, the tool author's native language was also brought into question. Uh, this is the author of a free tool that was posted online that these guys happened to use. I don't know why that has anything to do with anything. Essentially, it came down to where expert researchers just trust us. But turns out the, all of these expert researchers worked for vendors that would also sell you a solution to APT. Yay! So some other things you want to look at is what's the population or base rate um, for the uh, command and control servers that they're using and the populations of the areas, the availability of the information that they had. Um, and again, as vendors, this was very much uh, a self-serving bias at work here. Some other areas we're going to run through quickly that uh, you can actually look and see these biases at effect. Doxing. Doxing is wrong. Like, it, it, they get it wrong so often. It's not even funny. And they call out real people uh, who have to then change their name, change their job, uh, because they got a, a bad dox dropped on them. Uh, DDoS attacks. Um, you know, there's a lot of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt around that. Use your uh, base theorem, look at the base rate. You want to look at the statistical methodology that they used? What is the sample size? How long have they been collecting the data? If you tell me there's been an increase of 1,152% in NTP reflection attacks, oh, you've only been collecting data over the past three months. Well, of course that number is going to be huge because there was a recent spike, but it starts to normalize over time. Uh, Newsweek outing the quote-unquote creator of Bitcoin. Um, yeah, how's that going for them? They're in their second round of uh, being sued. Um, the search for the Malaysia Airways flight MH370. This one was really interesting. Um, this is the culmination. This picture is the culmination of uh, hours and hours of tedious research um, through open source information to find the downed plane. Uh, and when this group uh, outed that they had found it, uh, turns out this photo uh, they got from Google Maps, which is updated in real time, right? All right, so what do we do? Metacognition, thinking about thinking. So you want to ask yourselves, when dealing with any data that you're you know, going to assume to be true, you want to say, what do I think I know? How do I think I know it? And when would it not be true? And this is just generally good, three good questions to ask you know, throughout the day to yourself and your regular life. What do I think I know? How do I think I know it? And when would it not be true? Um, also, there's another thing to look out for, and this is getting a little meta. It's the bias bias or the bias blind spot. This is the belief that your personal bias is actually insight. And it gets worse. Through lots of research by Emily Pronin at the Princeton University, um, she finds that um, uh, a lot of people report being less susceptible to bias themselves, and they will be likely to infer bias in others, especially when they hold a contrary opinion. So not only is my bias actually insight, but you have some huge bias going on over there. 
So you can actively seek out peer review, diverse outside expertise, and alternative mindsets that will help you mitigate some of that. But Dr. Richard Tuer says that similar to an optical illusion, don't stare at that too long, um, they remain compelling even when you're fully aware of their nature. So we can implement frameworks. One is the structure, or checklist for analysts, and I can give you the extended slides for these. You can actually go through them slowly. And that one was developed by the CIA um, back in the 60s to help um, have their, their intelligence become more and more useful. Um, and the second was the structured analytic techniques for improving intelligence analysis. This one has diagnostic techniques, contrarian techniques, and imaginative thinking techniques. And it tells you when to use things like devil's advocacy, team A, team B analysis, which is a lot of fun, um, a high impact, low probability analysis, black swan analysis. I'm sure some of you are aware of that. Um, also, what if analysis, uh, Excel has a plugin for that one. Um, and uh, they give you a timeline uh, for when each of these things would be more useful. Um, when you've got a lot, of your, uh, a lot of your data and analysis already in, you can play a really good devil's advocate. That's why that's towards the back. Um, and throughout the whole thing, you want to be doing your key assumptions checks. What do I think I know? How do I think I know it? And when would it not be true? So what do we do in the application of these? Well, when we're putting out our reports or are stating our intelligence, we want to say, what's our goal here? And make it very clear. Who are our sources? Who's the audience we're targeting? And please give your limitations and assumptions. This one's missed a lot. But more important than any of these, show me your methodology. I'm not going to just take your word for it that you're an expert researcher and I should just trust you. I want to be able to repeat what you did. And I want other people to be able to repeat what I'm repeating. That's how science works. So there's, of course, some further research that would be great, um, looking at the tools we were talking about before. They have baked in bias. Uh, looking at the cultural and economic context that data arises. Data is not in a vacuum. So this data that we're using to build intelligence, uh, it has its own historical context, its own uh, chain before it got to us, and pressures on it before it got to us. So analyzing all of that. And a lot of times, data is created by human beings who also have their biases at work. So mitigating for that is a whole other realm of research. So I'd like to hear um, you know, from, from all of you, of course. Uh, and you know, I think we can really take threat intelligence um, out of the realm of lining the pockets of vendors and into the realm of actually doing good for the people in the world and making an impact and protecting people and having a, a safer environment online and a safer digital life. All right, thank you, and I'm ready to take questions. Yeah, it's going to be on the website. Also, if you email me, um, I, I can give you even more extended slides, um, which give a, a list of um, readings. Uh, there's one reading that's a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's called Managerial Decision Making, but it has a bunch of exercises in it that allow you to see your own biases right in front of your face at work. And it's a little freaky. OK, so thank you so much for the presentation.